He spoke, and furious hurled against the ground, his scepter starred with golden studs around, then sternly silent sat with like disdain. The raging king returned his frowns again. <clears throat> to calm their passion with the words of age, slow from his seat arose the Pylian sage. Pylos is a land in ancient Greece, and this is an old wise man named Nestor, who we'll read a lot more about. <clears throat> he rises up to speak to try and calm this fight between Agamemnon and Achilles. To calm their passion with the words of age, slow from his seat arose the Pylian sage, experienced Nestor, in persuasion skilled, words sweet as honey from his lips distilled. Two generations now had passed away, wise by his rules and happy by his sway. Two ages o'er his native realm he reigned, and now the temple of the third remained. I'm sorry, now the example of the third remained. All viewed with awe this venerable man, who thus with mild benevolence began. These are the words of Nestor, an old wise king from Pylos. What shame! What woe is this to Greece! What joy to Troy's proud monarchs and the friends of Troy! That adverse gods commit to stern debate the breast, the best, the bravest of the Grecian state. Young as ye are, this youthful heat restrain, nor think your Nestor's years and wisdom vain. A godlike race of heroes once I knew, such as no more these aged eyes shall view. Lives there a chief to match Pirithus' fame, Dryas the bold, or Aeneas' deathless name, Theseus endued with more than mortal might, or Polyphemus like the gods in fight. With these of old to toils of battle bred, in early youth my hardy days I led, fired with the thirst which virtuous envy breeds, and smit with love of honorable deeds. Strongest of men, they pierced the mountain boar, ranged the wild deserts red with monsters' gore, and from their hills the shaggy centaurs tore. Yet these, with soft, persuasive arts, I swayed. When Nestor spoke, they listened and obeyed. If in my youth even these esteemed me wise, do you young warriors hear my age advice? Atrides, seize not on the beauteous slave, that prize the Greeks by common suffrage gave. So Nestor tells Agamemnon not to take the woman from Achilles. Nor thou, Achilles, Treat our prince with pride. Let kings be just, and sovereign power preside. So we see here Nestor teaches this idea that the kings have the power to do what they will. Their power is absolute. <coughs> Thee, the first honors of the war adorn, like gods in strength, and of a goddess born. Him, awful majesty, exalts above the powers of earth and sceptered sons of Jove. So he says, look, Achilles, you are great. You're a godlike warrior, first and greatest in battle. But Agamemnon is also a king, 
established and given authority by the gods. You both have to recognize both and not allow your pride and emotions to cause you to be divided. <clears throat> Let both unite with well-consenting mind. So shall authority, the king, and strength, Achilles, be joined. Leave me, O king, to calm Achilles' rage. Rule thou thyself as more advanced in age. Forbid it, gods, Achilles should be lost, the pride of Greece and bulwark of our host. And just so you know, host means army. <clears throat> this said, Nestor ceased. The king of men, Agamemnon, replies, Thy years are awful, are awesome, are you know, amazing, wonderful. And thy words are wise. But that imperious, that unconquered soul, no laws can limit, no respect control. Before his pride must his superiors fall. His word the law, and he the Lord of all? Him must our hosts, our chiefs, our self obey? What king can bear a rival in his sway? Grant that the gods his matchless force have given. Has foul reproach a privilege from heaven? Here on the monarch's speech Achilles broke, and furious thus, and interrupting spoke. Tyrant, I well deserve thy galling chain, to live thy slave and still to serve in vain. Should I submit to such unjust decree, command thy vassals, but command not me. Seize on Briseis, whom the Grecians doomed, my prize of war, yet tamely see resumed. And seize secure, no more Achilles draws, his conquering sword in any woman's cause. The gods command me to forgive the past, but lest this first invasion be the last. For know, thy blood, when next thou darest invade, shall stream in vengeance on my wrecking blade. So Achilles says, I'm not going to fight over this woman. The gods have told me to bear with this problem. You can go and take her. And I'll let you do so in peace, but if you ever come again, I'll kill you. At this they ceased. The stern debate expired. The chiefs in sullen majesty retired. Achilles with Patroclus took his way, where near his tents his hollow vessels lay. Meantime, Atreides launched with numerous oars, a well-rigged ship for Chrysa's sacred shores. So Agamemnon is sending the girl back to Chryses. High on the deck was fair Chryseus placed, and sage Ulysses with the conduct graced. Safe in her sides, in the sides of the ship, the hecatomb they stowed the animals for sacrifice. Then, swiftly sailing, cut the liquid road. It's a figure of speech to refer to sailing through the water, to cut the liquid road. The host, or army, to expiate next the king prepares with pure lustrations and with solemn prayers. Washed by the briny wave, briny means salty, the salt water of the ocean. Washed by the briny wave, the pious train are cleansed and cast the ablutions in the main. The main is the sea. Along the shore, whole hecatombs, hecatombs were laid. All the sacrifices were prepared. And bulls and goats to Phoebus' altars paid. They sacrificed 
animals to Phoebus Apollo. The sable fumes in curling spires arise and waft their grateful odors to the skies. The smoke of the sacrifices are, is, are circling up to heaven with grateful odors. That is the smell of the sacrifices pleasing to the gods. The army thus in sacred rites engaged, Atrides, Agamemnon, still with deep resentment raged. To wait his will, two sacred heralds stood, Talthebius and Eurybates the Good. Now Agamemnon gives these two messengers his command to go and get the girl from Achilles. Haste to the fierce Achilles' tent, he cries. Thence bear Briseis as our royal prize. Submit he must, or if they will not part, our self in arms shall tear her from his heart. The unwilling heralds act their lord's commands. Pensive they walk along the barren sands. Arrived, the hero in his tent they find, with gloomy aspect, with sad or angry face, on his arm reclined. At awful distance, long they silent stand, loath to advance and speak their hard command. Decent confusion this the godlike man perceived, and thus, with accent mild, began. So Achilles addresses the two messengers sent by Agamemnon. With leave and honor enter our abodes, ye sacred ministers of men and gods. I know your message. By constraint you came, not you but your imperious lord I blame. Patroclus haste, the fair Briseis bring, conduct my captive to the haughty king. But witness, heralds, and proclaim my vow, witness to gods above and men below. But first and loudest to your prince declare that lawless tyrant whose commands you bear. <clears throat> Unmoved as death, Achilles shall remain. Though prostrate Greece shall bleed at every vein, the raging chief in frantic passion lost, blind to himself and useless to his host, unskilled to judge the future by the past, in blood and slaughter shall repent at last. Patroclus, now the unwilling beauty brought, she, in soft sorrows and in pensive thought, passed silent as the heralds held her hand, and of looked back, slow moving o'er the strand. Not so his loss the fierce Achilles bore, but sad, retiring to the sounding shore. O'er the wild margin of the deep he hung, that kindred deep from whence his mother, Thetis, sprung. There, bathed in tears of anger and disdain, thus Achilles loud lamented to the stormy main. He cried out in sadness and frustration. He cried out sitting on the seashore, crying out to the sea. And it's significant because his mother, the goddess Thetis, is a goddess who was born out of the sea. Achilles cries out and says, O parent goddess, since in early bloom thy son must fall by too severe a doom. There's a little background needed here. Achilles, um, received a certain fate when he was born. He was told that he would live a short 
but glorious life rather than a long and happy life. And so he believes that his life, because he sort of accepted this fate of having a short life, that his life should be filled with glory. And yet now he's being asked in this short life that he was given, he's, he's being asked to suffer and be wronged. And he feels like, if I'm going to be wronged, then I deserve a long life as a reward. And if I'm going to be taken at a young age, then I don't deserve to have to suffer like this. That's the deal. And so he's crying out to his mother saying, what's going on here? This isn't fair. My destiny seems to not be honored by the gods. O parent goddess, since in early bloom thy son must fall by too severe a doom. Sure to so short a race of glory born, great Jove in justice should this span, this short span of life, adorn. Honor and fame, at least the thunderer owed, and ill he pays the promise of a god. If yon proud monarch thus thy son defies, obscures my glories, and resumes my prize. So he complains that his situation is not fair and the gods are not doing what they should. Far from the deep recesses of the main, the sea, where aged ocean, that's a god, ocean, holds his watery rain, his goddess mother heard the waves divide, and like a mist she rose above the tide and beheld him mourning on the naked shores, and thus the sorrows of his soul explores. So here Thetis the goddess speaks to Achilles. Why grieves my son? Thy anguish let me share. Reveal the cause and trust a parent's care. He, deeply sighing, said to tell my woe, is but to mention what too well you know. From Thebe, sacred to Apollo's name, Etion's realm, our conquering army came, with treasure loaded and triumphant spoils, whose just division crowned the soldiers' toils. But bright Chryseis' heavenly prize was led by vote selected to the general's bed. The priest of Phoebus sought by gifts to gain his beauteous daughter from the victor's chain. The fleet he reached and lowly bending down held forth the scepter and the laurel crown, entreating all but chief implored of grace for grace the brother kings, remember Menelaus and Agamemnon, of Atreus's royal race. The generous Greeks their joint consent declare, the priest to reverence and release the fair. Not so Atreides. He, with wonted pride, the sire insulted and his gifts denied. The insulted sire his God's peculiar care, to Phoebus prayed, and Phoebus heard his prayer. A dreadful plague ensues, the avenging darts incessant fly and pierce the Grecian hearts. A prophet then, inspired by heaven, arose, and points the crime, and thence derives the woes. Myself, the first the assembled chiefs incline to avert the vengeance of the power divine. Then, rising in his wrath, the monarch stormed. Incensed, he threatened, and his threats performed. The fair Chryseis, 
to her sire was sent with offered gifts to make the god relent. But now he seized Briseis' heavenly charms and of my valor's prize <clears throat> defrauds my arms, defrauds the votes of all the Grecian train, and service, faith, and justice plead in vain. But goddess, thou thy suppliant son attend, to high Olympus's shining court ascend, urge all the ties to former service owed, and sue for vengeance to the thundering God. So we see here in the Greek religion a system of intercession where a man will ask for the prayers of a god or goddess that that god or goddess would go and intercede for him with the higher gods on Mount Olympus. Oft hast thou triumphed in the glorious boast that thou stoodst forth of all the ethereal host. When bold rebellion shook the realms above, the undaunted guard of cloud-compelling Jove. When the bright partner of his awful reign, the warlike maid and monarch of the main, <clears throat> the traitor gods, by mad ambition driven, durst threat with chains the omnipotence of heaven. Then called by thee the monster titan came, whom gods, Briareus, men, Aegean, name. Through wandering skies enormous stalked along, not he that shakes the solid earth so strong. With giant pride at Jove's high throne he stands, and brandished round him all his hundred hands. The affrighted gods confessed their awful lord. They dropped the fetters, trembled, and adored. This goddess, this to his remembrance call, embrace his knees, at his tribunal fall. Conjure him far to drive the Grecian train, to hurl them headlong to their fleet and main, to heap the shores with copious death and bring the Greeks to know the curse of such a king. Let Agamemnon lift his haughty head o'er all his wide dominion of the dead, and mourn in blood that ere he durst disgrace the boldest warrior of the Grecian race. So simply Achilles asks his mother Thetis to intercede for him with Jupiter. One, one um, observation to make here is, it seems clear that, that Homer is using Achilles to question the nature of the power and authority, or the limit of the power and authority of kings. Because if you read Achilles' words carefully, you'll see that he's not just questioning Agamemnon. He's questioning the, the, the concept of this all-controlling king who has a right to do whatever he pleases. And he's saying there are other things to consider. For example, the justice due towards subjects. A king doesn't have the right to just do whatever he wants. He has to keep promises. He has to respect rewards that have been given, that have been justly earned and are deserved by subjects. He's not free to do whatever he wants. And then as Achilles complains to the gods, he's basically saying, is this doctrine of absolute power true? Or should this king be accountable to higher standards of justice and mercy? Okay, if we look at all the things that Agamemnon's done so far, he's disrespected a king, uh, a priest. He's disrespected the gods. He's broken promises to his own subjects. He's ignored the counsel of elder wise men. He's mistreated one of his greatest and most faithful soldiers. He's unjustly taken a prize away from Achilles. And we see this list of unjust things 
that have been done by Agamemnon. And it seems that Homer's story is investigating the question of what power kings really should possess. So let's keep that in mind as we continue reading. It seems that Achilles is questioning this power and authority of kings. Now Thetis, Achilles' mother, responds, Unhappy son, fair Thetis thus replies, While tears celestial trickle from her eyes, Why have I borne thee with a mother's throes To fates averse and nursed for future woes? So short a space the light of heaven to view, so short a space, and filled with sorrow, too. So even Thetis recognizes that Achilles' complaint is just. He was given a short life, and is now being denied the glory that was promised him in that short life. <clears throat> oh, might a parent's careful wish prevail. Far, far from Ilion should thy vessels sail. And if I haven't mentioned it, Ilion is, an, is the Greek name for Troy. It's where the name Iliad comes from. Far, far from Ilion should thy vessel sail, and thou from camps remote the danger shun, which now, alas, too nearly threats my son. Yet what I can to move thy suit, I'll go, to great Olympus crowned with fleecy snow, Meantime, secure within thy ships from far, behold the field, not mingle in the war. The sire of gods and all the ethereal train, on thee warm limits of the farthest main, now mix with mortals, nor disdain to grace the feast of Ethiopia's blameless race. So Thetis tells him, I want you to go to your ships and just stay put. The gods are actually visiting the Ethiopians for a, for a feast, and they'll be back in, um, she's going to say how many days it is. I don't think she said that yet. But so she tells Achilles, stay put, give me some time. I will go to Jupiter and uh, intercede for you. Twelve days, there it is. Twelve days the powers indulge the genial rite, returning with the twelfth revolving light. So she says, give me 12 days and I'll speak to Jupiter. Then will I mount the brazen dome <clears throat> and move the high tribunal of immortal Jove. The goddess spoke. The rolling waves unclosed. <clears throat> then down the steep she plunged from whence she rose and left him sorrowing on the lonely coast, in wild resentment for the fair, he lost. In Chrysa's port, now we change scenes. We're now in Chrysa, which is the land where Chryses lives, the priest. In Chrysa's port, now sage Ulysses rode. Beneath the deck, the destined victims stowed. The sails they furled, they lashed the mast aside, and dropped their anchors, and the pinnace tied. Next on the shore, their hecatomb they land, Chryseus last descending on the strand. Her thus returning from the furrowed main, Ulysses led to Phoebus's sacred fame, that is, Apollo's holy temple where at his solemn altar as the maid he gave to Chryses, thus the hero Ulysses said. Ulysses says this to Chryses. Hail, reverend priest, to Phoebus's awful dome, a suppliant I, from great Atrides come. Unransomed, here receive the spotless fair, accept the hecatomb the Greeks Prepare. And may thy God, who scatters darts around, atoned by sacrifice, desist to wound. At this, 
the sire, Chryses, embraced the maid again, so sadly lost, so lately sought in vain. Then near the altar of the darting king, disposed in rank their hecatomb they bring. With water purify their hands. Here we see um, how uh, an ancient Greek sacrifice was performed. With water purify their hands and take the sacred offering of the salted cake, while thus with arms devoutly raised in the air and solemn voice, the priest directs his prayer. So here's the prayer of Chryses, a prayer of um, atonement and intercession, asking Apollo for the plague to stop. God of the silver bow, thy ear incline, whose power encircles Scylla the divine, whose sacred eye thy tenedos surveys and gilds fair Chrysa with, uh, with distinguished rays. If fired to vengeance at thy priest's request, thy direful darts inflict the raging pestilence. Once more attend, listen once more, avert the wasteful woe, and smile, propitious, and unbend thy bow. So Chryses prayed, Apollo heard his prayer, and now the Greeks their hecatomb prepare. Between their horns the salted barley threw, and with their heads to heaven the victims slew. The limbs they sever from the enclosing hide, the thighs selected to the gods divide. On these and double calls involved with art, the choicest morsels lay from every part. The priest himself before his altar stands and burns the offering with his holy hand. So they burn the best portions of the meat as a sacrifice. To the gods. They give it to the, to the priest, and he puts it up on the altar and burns it, the best portions of the animal's meat. <clears throat> the priest himself before his altar stands and burns the offering with his holy hands, pours the black wine and sees the flames aspire, the youth with instruments surround the fire. The thighs thus sacrifice and entrails dressed, the assistants part, transfix and roast the rest. Then spread the tables, the repast prepare, each takes his seat and each receives his share. So at a sacrifice, a part of the meal was sacrificed to the god. And the rest of the meat was shared and eaten as a feast by the worshippers who were there present. So this idea of sacrificing to the God, really what it, what it was, was gathering for a feast at which the relationship between men and the God would be restored. And this feast would be a celebration of the restoration of the relationship between the men and the God. It was a celebration, celebrated with a feast. The best portions were given to the God, and the men sat and enjoyed the rest with the priest who approved of their sacrifice. <clears throat> then spread the tables, the repast prepare, each takes his seat and each receives his share. When now the rage of hunger was repressed with pure libations, that means drink offerings, they pour out a portion of their wine as another sacrifice to the God. With pure libations they conclude the feast, the youths with wine the copious goblets crowned, and pleased dispense the flowing bowls around. With hymns divine the joyous banquet ends, 
The Pollyans lengthened till the sun descends. The Greeks restored. The grateful notes prolonged. Apollo listens and approves the song. So their sacrifice and worship is accepted by Apollo. Twas night. The chiefs beside their vessel lie till rosy morn had purpled o'er the sky. This is a, a figurative description of of dawn, of the sun beginning to rise, and the, the sky turning red and purple as the sun rises. Till rosy morn had purpled o'er the sky. Then launch and hoist the mast, indulgent gales or friendly winds, supplied by Phoebus Apollo, fill the swelling sails. The milk-white canvas Bellying as they blow, the parted ocean foams and roars below. Above the bounding billows, swift they flew, till now the Grecian camp appeared in view. Far on the beach they haul their bark to land, the crooked keel divides the yellow sand. They run ashore um, as they reach the land. Then part where stretched along the winding bay, the ships and tents in mingled prospect lay. So the excursion to Chrysa, where Chryses the priest and the temple of Apollo were, was successful. Chryses was returned, um, and the Greeks return happy that the pestilence is now ended. But raging still, Amidst his navy sat, the stern Achilles steadfast in his hate, nor mixed in combat nor in council joined, but wasting cares lay heavy on his mind. In his black thoughts revenge and slaughter roll, and scenes of blood rise dreadful in his soul. Twelve days were past, remember why that's important? The gods were away for twelve days. Twelve days were past, and now the dawning light the gods had summoned to the Olympian height. The gods are returning to Mount Olympus. Jove, first ascending from the watery bowers, leads the long order of ethereal or heavenly powers. When, like the morning mist in early day, rose from the flood the daughter of the sea, and to the seats divine her flight addressed, there far apart and high above the rest. The thunderer, Jove, Jupiter, sat. He's called the thunderer, Jupiter. The thunderer sat where old Olympus shrouds his hundred heads in heaven and props the clouds. Suppliant, the goddess, Thetis stood. A suppliant is one who bows in the presence of another and asks for help. That's a suppliant. And we'll see in Greece there was sort of a, um, a formal procedure for this where the suppliant would kneel, and we'll see Thetis do this. She'll embrace the knees of Jupiter, and she'll reach up with one hand and place it under his chin as a sign of you know, a suppliant begging for mercy from um, whoever she's appealing to for assistance. And we'll see that here. <clears throat> suppliant, the goddess stood, one hand she placed beneath his beard, and one his knees embraced. And this is what she says to Jupiter. If e'er, O father of the gods, she said, my words could please thee, or my actions aid. Some marks of honor on my son bestow, and pay in glory what in life you owe, it was promised to him. Fame is at least by heavenly promise due to life so short, and now dishonored too. It's not supposed to be that way for Achilles. Avenge this wrong, O oh, ever just and wise, 
Let Greece be humbled, and the Trojans, their enemies, rise. Till the proud king and all the Achaean or Greek race shall heap with honors him they now disgrace. So she says, punish the Greeks and help the Trojans so that the Greeks suffer and they restore the honor of my son Achilles. Thus Thetis spoke, but Jove in silence held, the sacred counsels of his breast concealed. Not so repulsed, the goddess closer pressed. So seeing that Jupiter didn't say no, Thetis draws closer. Still grasped his knees and urged her dear request. O sire of gods and men, thy suppliant here, refuse or grant, for what has Jove to fear? Or, O, oh, declare of all the powers above, is wretched Thetis least the care of Jove? Do you not care about me, jo Jupiter? She said, and sighing, thus the god replies, who rolls the thunder o'er the vaulted skies. What hast thou asked? Ah, why should Jove engage? In foreign contests and domestic rage, the gods' complaints and Juno's fierce alarms, while I to partial aid the Trojan arms? Go, lest the haughty partner of my sway with jealous eyes thy close access survey. So Jupiter says to Thetis, get out of here before my wife sees you because my wife will know something's up if she sees Thetis close to Jupiter asking for something, uh, because it seems that Jupiter is going to grant it to her. But part in peace, secure thy prayer is sped. Witness the sacred honors of our head, the nod that ratifies the will divine, the faithful fixed and irrevocable sign. This seals thy suit, and this fulfills thy vows. He spoke, and awful, terrifying, bends his sable brows, so he nods his head and grants her prayer, <clears throat> which is all that needs to be done by Jupiter. Shakes his ambrosial curls and gives the nod the stamp of fate and sanction of the god. High heaven, with trembling, the dread signal took, and all Olympus to the center shook. Swift to the seas, profound or deep, swift to the deep seas, the goddess flies, Jove to his starry mansions in the skies. The shining synod of the immortals wait the coming god and from their thrones of state, arising silent, wrapped in holy fear, before the majesty of heaven appear. Trembling they stand while Jove assumes the throne, all but the god's imperious queen alone. Everyone's there except Juno. Late had she viewed the silver-footed dame. Juno saw Thetis, and all her passions kindled into flame. She's angry. Say, now we see here sort of a, a fight between Juno and her husband, Jupiter. Juno loves the Greeks, and she knows what Thetis is seeking, and she's upset if Jupiter grants it to her. Say, Artful manager of heaven, she cries, who now partakes the secrets of the skies. Or I should, I should read that differently. Say, or tell me, artful manager of heaven, she cries, who now partakes the secrets of the skies? In other words, who is that that you were just speaking to? Thy Juno knows not the decrees of fate, 
in vain the partner of imperial state. So the gods don't all have equal powers. Juno says she doesn't know the decrees of fate, but Jupiter does. He's God Almighty in the Greek religion. What favorite goddess, then, those cares divides, which Jove in prudence from his consort, from his wife, hides? And so now Jove, or Jupiter, um, Jove is just a case of the Latin name Jupiter. To this the thunderer, seek not thou to find. This is Jupiter speaking to Juno. Seek not thou to find the sacred counsels of almighty mind. Involved in darkness likes the great decree, nor can the depths of fate be pierced by thee. What fits thy knowledge, thou the first shall know. The first of gods above and men below, but thou nor they shall search the thoughts that roll deep in the close recesses of my soul. In other words, you will never know what I know. I am God Almighty, and you are subject. Full on, the sire of the goddess of the skies rolled the large orbs of her majestic eyes, and thus returned. Juno responds and says, Austere Saturnius, say, from whence this wrath, or who controls thy sway? Thy boundless will for me remains in force, and all thy counsels take the destined course. But tis for Greece I fear. There's Juno's concern. She's concerned about the Greeks. But tis for Greece I fear. For late was seen, in close consult, the silver-footed Queen. The fact that she was close so shows that Jupiter favored her request, and she's referring to Thetis, the mother of Achilles. Jove to his Thetis nothing could deny, nor was the signal vain that shook the sky. What fatal favor has the goddess won to grace her fierce, inexorable son? perhaps in Grecian blood to drench the plain and glut his vengeance with my people, Greece, slain. Then thus the god, Jupiter, responds to Juno, O restless fate of pride that strives to learn what heaven resolves to hide. Vain is the search, presumptuous and abhorred, anxious to thee and odious to thy Lord. Let this suffice, the immutable decree, no force can shake what is that ought to be. Goddess, submit, nor dare our will withstand, but dread the power of this avenging hand. The united strength of all the gods above in vain resists the omnipotence of Jove. Again, Greek religion. Jupiter is the most powerful. He's omnipotent. He knows all. And all the other gods combined cannot do anything against him. Tells his wife Juno, to stay in her lane and do what she's told and not to meddle in his affairs. The thunderer spoke, nor durst the queen reply. A reverent horror silenced all the sky. The feast disturbed with sorrow, Vulcan saw his mother menaced and the gods in awe. So all the gods are gathered together. It should be a time of of happiness and celebration, and instead Vulcan sees that there is something wrong going on. So what is he going to do? He's going to try to lighten the mood. Peace at his heart and pleasure his design, 
Thus interposed the architect divine. He says, The wretched quarrels of the mortal state are far unworthy gods of your debate. Let men their days in senseless strife employ, we in eternal peace and constant joy. Thou, goddess mother, with our sire comply, nor break the sacred union of the sky. Lest roused to rage he shake the blessed abodes, launch thee red lightning and dethrone the gods. If you submit, the thunderer stands appeased, the gracious power is willing to be pleased. Thus Vulcan spoke, and rising with a bound, the double bowl with sparkling nectar crowned, which held to Juno in a cheerful way. Goddess, he cried, be patient and obey. Dear as you are, if Jove his arm extend, I can but grieve, unable to defend. What god so daring in your aid to move, or lift his hand against the force of Jove? Once in your cause I felt his matchless might, hurled headlong down from the ethereal height, tossed all the day in rapid circles round, nor till the sun descended touched the ground. Breathless I fell, in giddy motion lost, the Scythians raised me on the Lemnian coast. He said, and to her hands the goblet heaved, which, with a smile, the white-armed queen received. Then to the rest he filled, and in his turn, each to his lips, applied the nectared urn. Vulcan, with awkward grace, his office plies, and unextinguished laughter shakes the skies. Thus the blessed gods the genial day prolong, in feasts ambrosial and celestial song. Apollo tuned the lyre, the muses round, with voice, alternate aid, the silver sound. And this is the end of book one of Homer's Iliad. So just to quickly recap, we have in the beginning, after a victory of the Greeks, the men divide the spoils. Um, there are women taken captive, beautiful women who are assigned to men as rewards. Achilles is given a woman named uh, Briseis, Agamemnon the king is given a woman named Chryseis. She turns out to be the daughter of the priest of Apollo. He's asked to return her. Um, he refuses to do so. Chryseis the priest prays for vengeance. Apollo strikes the Greeks with a plague. They seek to find out the cause of the plague so they can be saved from it. Um, a, a prophet says that um, Agamemnon's captive girl is the cause of the plague. So Agamemnon agrees to release her, but demands that he receive another woman. So he takes Achilles' woman. That dishonor angers Achilles. Achilles vows to never help Agamemnon again. Then Achilles asks his mother Thetis to intercede with the gods for him. Jupiter grants Thetis' request and promises to bring honor to Achilles and as book one ends, the gods are celebrating on Mount Olympus. I hope that's a helpful guide to book one of the Iliad. Um, book two is a difficult read, and we'll just force our way through it, as you'll see. But um, book one is very important because it establishes the whole story and the context. So make sure now you take your time, reread the whole book, study it for mastery, and then we'll be able to move on to book two and the rest of the Iliad. I hope that's helpful. God bless your studies.